Okay, so today is our, our last lecture on the topic of cavities, and it'll be our also our last lecture on the topic of Gaussian beams, and it's the combination of the two. So what happens when you have a, a cavity that's not just plane mirrors, which is what we've been talking about so far, that's usually kind of difficult to work with, uh, having an infinite plane wave with infinite plane mirrors in, our, in all of our real cavities, both laser cavities and uh, spectrum analysis cavities, uh, we tend to have spherical mirrors. And the correct solution to Maxwell's equations with spherical mirrors ends up being uh, Gaussian standing waves. And let me just remind you of what, what the Gaussian beam looks like. So this is you know, the hundredth time I've written this. E plus, the complex, complex form of the electromagnetic field. I'm not gonna write, uh, I'm gonna assume that we just have a single polarization, which is actually our next topic. So I'm not gonna worry about the, the vector symbol on E. I'm just gonna say, let's imagine everything is vertically polarized. There's no, there's no, uh, no different components. This complex wave is some, some constant here, E naught, oh, sorry, E. Actually, that's a subscript. E naught plus, and then this width W naught over W of Z, and then exponent of minus R squared over W of Z squared. This gives us our Gaussian intensity profile, plus some phase factors, I, K, Z, where again, K is two pi over the wavelength, plus arc tangent of z over z naught plus the part that gives it the spherical curvature of the wavefronts i times k r squared over 2 r of z and let me remind you what a few of these terms are because we'll actually use them, use them later. Uh, w of z is the sort of one sigma width of the intensity as a function of z, and that is w naught, which is the width at the origin times the square root of one plus z over z naught squared. Um, z naught is just a parameter that has to do with the wavelength and the width, so pi. Uh, w naught squared over lambda, the wavelength, and r of z, which sets this curvature that's going to be important for today. r of z, if you'll recall, is z times one, oops, one plus z naught over z squared. Okay, so this is just a review from last time. And let me go a little bit further and remind you of how these things work. So, so a right, right going, right going traveling wave. What does this look like? Well, this is the complex, um, complex electric field, but of course electric fields are actually real. So a right-going traveling wave is this complex amplitude here, E plus of R times E to the minus I omega T. Remember the positive, what we call the positive frequency component is positive spatial frequencies. In order to have the wave go forward in time, that always comes with the minus time frequency. Uh, that's just how, uh, how waves work if you have a, uh, x minus something like the cosine of, I'll do this up here, cosine of, uh, let's see that, yeah, cosine of x minus velocity times time. This is a cosine that's going forward uh, at a velocity v, and the signs have to be opposite. So we keep the, the positive sign here is the positive of the kz, and that comes with the negative time component, plus it's this complex conjugate. So complex conjugate of e plus is just e minus, 
that's the spatial component and the compass conjugate of this is either plus i omega t. So I'll, I'll show you a plot of this again to remind you what this looks like. It's a, it's a complex number that's moving to the right. And now left, left traveling wave. Oh, it's, this is a real number, so I can't take the complex conjugate of this, but uh, left traveling wave is kind of the opposite mix of things. So E minus with e to the minus I omega T plus the complex conjugate of this term to make it the net result real E plus e to the plus I omega T. And if I were to add these together or, or subtract them, but usually we add them together, if I were to add these together, what I would get is I would get a standing wave. So instead of having wave fronts that uh, travel, um, you know, these are real wave fronts now, you know, positive and negative numbers that are traveling to the right or real numbers that are traveling to the left. In a standing wave, you have real numbers that whose spatial shape stays in place. It just sort of slowly blinks in and out. And let me just share my screen again and, and show you some plots from before about what those are. And uh, we'll plunk down some mirrors in, in different positions and actually talk about that in more detail today. So let me see, share screen. Okay, so this is the Jupyter notebook that you had access to. I just load a few things here, load the complex number plotting and uh, plot a Gaussian beam. And the W naught, remember, is the width at the origin. W of Z is the width at any particular Z. And R of Z sets the radius of curvature of these uh, wave fronts. OK, so this is just a snapshot in, in time. Um, I don't need to worry about any of this other stuff. I'm not going to show you different sizes. I am going to show you a right going traveling wave. So this is the, the first of these three things that I talked about. So an animation of a right going traveling wave is just these this rainbow pattern. So its intensity, if I were to scan back and forth here, its intensity would always be roughly the same. It's, its phase is changing. And uh, that's a right going wave. If I were to take the opposite, let me close this figure. If I were to take the opposite combination. Oh, oh, sorry. This is the, the right going traveling wave is just the first term here, E plus times E to the minus I omega T. If I were to take the full sum, I would get the real, real wave. So this only has positive numbers, which are red and negative numbers, which are this cyan color. <laughs> And it also travels slowly to the right. And now, instead of having the same amplitude as I scroll back and forth, uh, the real component, the amplitude of the sine and cosine are the same. But if I were to actually sample, it would be positive for a while, zero, negative, positive for a while, zero, negative. So uh, it's the magnitude of this number is not, is not constant as I scroll back and forth. So it's a little bit more jittery when I'm screen sharing. All right, and then I can do the same thing with the left going wave. I just add a different combination and the wave goes to the left. And if I were to take the right going plus the left going wave, I would get a standing wave. And the standing wave has exactly the same spatial structure. It's just that spatial structure is multiplied by a cosine of omega t in time. So if you take the same spatial structure multiplied by cosine of omega t in time, it just fades in and fades out. And notice that the, the zeros here are locked in place. And so since each of these was a solution to Maxwell's equations, any superposition of them is a solution to Maxwell's equations because Maxwell's equations are linear. And so this is a solution to Maxwell's equations with, here there are no boundary conditions. So the wave just goes on, on forever. 
if I were to put a perfectly conducting surface uh, along any one of these zeros, those boundary conditions would force the electric field to be zero at that perfectly conducting surface. And, uh, and this would still be a, a valid solution to that. Now, how you, how you, get, how you get it started is a, is a separate question that either you have, to, either you have to make the mirrors ever so slightly not perfectly conducting to let a little bit of light in, or you have to have a, a laser, you know, a gas that's actually starting to emit light. But just as a uh, solution to Maxwell's equation, this, this is a valid solution. Okay, now let's actually talk about putting these boundary conditions on. And in the animation before, I showed you, uh, I just made some mirrors that kind of zeroed out the field past some point here. So I just multiplied this by a matrix that was one within some radius and zero outside of some radius. And you can see that this uh, comes nicely to zero at, at the boundaries. But today we're going to talk a little bit more general about uh, what, what are the conditions for these mirrors and uh, consider some cases where the mirrors aren't perfectly symmetric and just sort of talk about what, what's going on there. All right, so let me, let me stop this. And uh, I don't think I changed this IPython notebook at all. So this is the one that, uh, that you were playing with. And stop sharing. Okay, so let me let me get rid of all this, and I will just draw draw a picture, which is uh, going to be much lower quality than the animations I just showed you, but will allow me to label it a little bit more carefully. Keep my definitions up there. Okay, so in the middle of the wave, uh, toward the focus of the beam, the, the wave fronts were pretty vertical. And then as, as they got bigger and bigger and bigger, they also got more and more and more curved. And you can see that because the radius of curvature as Z is much smaller than Z naught. How does this work? Uh, did, I, did I flip this? Oh, no, 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 this is right. When Z is much, much smaller than Z naught, um, Z naught over a tiny number is a huge number. And in, as you go towards zero, the radius, the radius here goes toward infinity. So the limit, uh, limit as Z goes to zero, R of Z, well, it's going to be one plus a huge number, so I can ignore the one. And that huge number is Z naught squared over Z squared, and one of those Z's is going to cancel, but not the other one. So this is still going to go, go to infinity. And an infinite radius of curvature means a flat, flat uh, sheet. All right, if you had a, a sphere with a certain radius of curvature and you made the radius of curvature bigger and bigger and bigger, the sphere would get flatter and flatter and flatter. So toward the origin, the radius of curvature is, is zero. And as you go out further and further and further, if we were to take the limit, limit as z goes to infinity, the radius of curvature for z, well, this would be, uh, so as z goes to infinity, we can ignore this term and it's just z times one. So this, this is Z. So as, as we go out to infinity, the radius of curvature gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So these, these curves are getting uh, more and more straight. But in the region where you're bigger than Z naught, uh, the, the radius kind of scales linearly with Z. And then this is symmetric on the other side. But I could put the mirrors anywhere I want. I could, I could put the, I put the mirror here, say, and here. So this is like the back of the mirror. And I'm gonna separate these by some distance D. And 
And I'm going to call the location of mirror one Z1 and the location of mirror two Z2. And of course, this, this here is, is zero for Z right at the focus. And I'm going to have a radius of curvature of this mirror R1, which is, uh, I will treat it as a number bigger than zero. It's the actual radius of this mirror if you were to grind it with a, um, grind the mirror with a spherical template. Uh, this would have some, some radius curvature R1. This would have some radius of curvature R2. And Z0 sort of depends on, on how, close, uh, how close this is. But let's, let's say Z0 is some distance that's sort of characteristic. The, the smaller you make this waist, W0, the closer Z0 is to the, to the origin. So let's just say Z0 is, is here. So plus, plus Z0 and minus Z0. And here, these mirrors are, are outside of Z0. But uh, we'll, we'll see what the, what the condition is for whether they have to be outside or have to be inside. All right, so um, we, when we talked about Gaussian means, we, we interpreted what this R of Z was as, as the radius of curvature of these wave fronts here. And so if we put down mirrors and we want to, uh, we want to have the boundary conditions of these mirrors line up with the zeros of those standing waves, then we need to have the radius of curvature of the mirror equal the radius of curvature of the Gaussian beam at that location. So uh, if, if I give you a Gaussian beam, you can plunk down mirrors anywhere you want and just look up what the radius of curvature is. And you'll know what, what radius of curvature of mirror you need. And if you have the mirror really close, the radius of curvature has to be really big. The mirror has to be very flat. As you get sort of in this middle range here, the radius of curvature is something reasonable. And as you get bigger and bigger and bigger, the radius of curvature gets flatter and flatter again. Uh, but we're going to ask kind of the inverse problem is, what if I just gave you two mirrors? Of, of radius of curvature R1 and R2, and I said that they're located uh, you know, at, at location Z, Z1 and Z2, a distance D apart. What, what does the, the beam look like? So that's, that's not starting with a beam and asking where the, where the mirrors are. It's starting with mirrors and saying, um, you know, if I were to excite uh, the Gaussian mode of this cavity somehow, by building up light inside of it, what would that mode look like? And for that, we can just use three, three, three pretty simple equations. It's just that the, the D, the separation between the mirrors is, is just Z2 minus Z1. And that, uh, let, let me start over here. Radius of curvature two, the radius of curvature of mirror two is just the radius of curvature R Evaluated at z2, so this is uh, z2 plus z0 squared over z2. Just expanding this, this out. And the other condition you have to be a little bit careful. R1. Well, R1 I've defined as a positive number here, but if I actually evaluate this. Uh, if I evaluate this at a negative z, if I evaluate this at a z on the left side of, of the origin here, I'm going to get a negative number. So in order to, to get the signs right, I have to say that this is negative r of z1. Just because this number is positive for positive curvatures and negative for negative curvatures, I'm defining the, the shape of the mirror to be a positive number. This is just minus minus z1 minus z0 squared over z1. Uh, and, and since z1 is probably a negative number, this, this works out fine. Uh, OK, so, so now this is just algebra. The question is, given 
given my separation between the mirrors, D, and given R2 and given R1, I want to solve for three unknowns. I want to solve for uh, basically the location of Z1 and Z2. That tells me the location of, uh, of the origin, right? If Z2 is 10 centimeters and Z1 is minus five centimeters, then I know, I know where my origin is with respect to one of the mirrors. Uh, and then the only other parameter that I could solve for is Z naught squared. And once I know Z naught squared, I know Z naught. Once I know Z naught for a, for a given wavelength, so say you're working with helium neon laser, for a given wavelength, this is fixed. And that fixes the waste of the beam at the origin. And once you know that, you know everything else. So, so given two mirrors and a separation, there's a unique Gaussian wave that can fit in, in those mirrors and satisfy those boundary conditions. And uh, let me, uh, I, I, the, the book gives, gives you the answer. It's just, you know, a lot of kind of messy, messy algebra to go through and, and solve for those things. Not particularly enlightening. Mathematica can just spit out the answer instantly. But what's interesting to note here is that when you solve this, this simple system of linear equations, it's linear in the variable z naught squared. So you're going to get some expression for z naught squared. z naught squared equals stuff. But uh, you know, in general, linear equations don't care about the sign. So this stuff could be either positive or negative. And this only makes sense. The solution is only valid if if z naught squared is is a positive number. And so there, uh, there are some criteria to make z naught squared a positive number so that you actually get a real solution to z naught. Uh, if you get an imaginary solution to z naught, you can plug things in and, and you'll see that uh, this is no longer a, a contained Gaussian beam. It ends up uh, sort of uh, uh, growing exponentially away from the origin instead of shrinking exponentially away from the origin. And that's, that does not satisfy the boundary conditions that they have a finite amount of energy. So let me write what those conditions are. You know, again, this is just doing this linear algebra to solve for z naught, and then looking at looking at what you get out. Um, maybe I guess I can erase this, this top two lines because I'm not going to need those. Well, while I'm erasing, anybody have any questions? Um, so the curvature of the mirror needs to match the curvature of the wavefronts? Yes. So that the electric field is zero at the mirrors? Yes. So let me share the screen again for a second. So this is... This is a standing wave. And let me run the animation again. So this is a plot over time. Oh, did it, what happened? There we go. It's a plot over time of the amplitude of the electric field at every point. And if you have a mirror, that's a, that's a piece of metal, you know, uh, well, it's usually glass coated with metal. The, from electromagnetism class, you learn that the electric field has to vanish on a conductor. And so the, the mirror has to be, uh, has to be at one of the, one of these zeros of the amplitude of the electric field. So depending on whether you think about there is an existing beam and I choose to put a mirror down in a way that is consistent with the field or going the other way where I just put two mirrors down and I ask what electric fields are valid, either way you frame that problem, the mirror has to, has to be along a, uh, 
along one of these troughs, or well, not troughs, along one of these zeros of the standing wave. Okay, so it's just, it's because the mirror is a conductor. Right, it's because the mirror is a conductor. And in this, you know, just, just to solve for what's inside, we're kind of assuming it's a perfect conductor, but, you know, real mirrors are, you know, maybe only 99% conductive to, to allow, allow a little bit of light in. But yeah, it's because it's a conductor that the electric field has to vanish on the mirror. And so any solution compatible with mirrors has to have zeros there. So if I had two plane mirrors, it would be pretty easy. I, I would just have a plane wave in between the mirrors that vanished at the mirrors. But uh, if I actually want a beam to come in or come out, then I, I need to have I need to have curved mirrors. And uh, because of the geometry of the Gaussian beam, these these curved mirrors are are sphere, spherical, you know, that, like a tiny piece of a, a sphere of a particular radius. Not necessarily a sphere that starts at the origin, a sphere that might start somewhere else. I'll talk about that when we get into a little bit more detail, but still it's a, a tiny piece of a sphere. Okay, that makes sense, thanks. All right, great. Um, so the condition that Z naught squared, so you know this, this is just a product of a bunch of Ds and Rs, but the condition that this is stuff is positive is the following. So let me define uh, G1. G1 is defined as one plus D over R1. And G2 is just the obvious one plus D over R2. And the condition that this be positive and therefore that Z not be a real number and therefore that this wave actually exists and doesn't exponentially blow up everywhere is just that, uh, so let me write it, yeah, Z naught squared bigger than or equal to zero is equivalent to the product of G1 and G2 being in between zero and one. So, I, you know, I, I don't, doing a lot of algebra is not particularly enlightening, but, uh, if this product is in between zero and one, this, uh, this solution exists. So um, for, for some random case where you have random different mirrors, uh, there's not much more you could say. This is a stabi stability criteria. So either, either a solution will exist or a solution will not exist. And for a particular separation between mirrors and particular mirror radii, you could plug these in and calculate what the product of G1 times G2 is and, and see, uh, see whether it's outside of this range. But uh, let's focus back on the symmetric cases because in the symmetric cases, there are some nice limits. So for, for symmetric, for symmetric case where R, R1 equals R2, well, first just by intuition and by symmetry, uh, if R1 is R2, that uh, even looking back at that the picture of the animation, uh, if, if my, the only place where the, the only place for the Gaussian beam to be if the mirrors were the same is, is if the waist was, was right at the center. So that, that fixes, that fixes where the waist is. So that means that Z1 is uh, minus minus D over two and Z2 is plus D over two. Let me switch pens here. Plus D over two. Um, and in this case, we can get, uh, we can get an expression for R. So let me just say that this magnitude of R1 is a magnitude of R2. Let me just call this R, some radius of curvature for the mirrors. In this case, Z naught, and, and this is much easier if you just plug, plug all this in, it's easy to solve. This is just D over two times the square root of two R over D minus one. 
and you can see that this is uh, this is very similar to uh, well, uh, let's yeah, let's just look at this. So so this is just assuming that everything is symmetric. The the z's are on opposite opposite and equal, and z naught is is this. And in order for z naught to be a real number um, for the symmetric case, yeah, what can I erase? I'll erase this. Yeah. No, I want to keep that. Sorry. Can I erase that stuff? So for, for Z not to be a real number, um, this thing has to be a positive number. So 2R over D, this first part has to be bigger than or equal to one. Or you could write this, if I, if I rearrange things, this is D is less than or equal to 2R. So if I have mirrors of a particular radius of curvature, I have to keep them closer than twice that radius of curvature. And, and let's let's look at some limits of this. So the first limit is is if I make the radius radius of the mirrors go to infinity. So or at least really big. So I, I keep the I keep the mirrors finite, but uh, well, let me just say that uh, okay, well, let's let's take the extreme limit where this where this radius really goes to infinity. So what does the radius of curvature of a mirror that goes to infinity mean? Well, that's a that's a plane, plane mirror. And so, so this is this is a planar cavity. So this is back to the case that we talked about maybe two lectures ago, where I just had two plane mirrors. Um, if if R is really huge, then D can be D can be anything. Right, as long as it's less than this huge number. So in the limit of truly planar mirrors, I can make a cavity of any size. That's uh, that won't uh, that won't affect anything. And now, now let's ask what what happens here. So if R goes to infinity, then what happens to Z naught? Well, Z naught uh, is this, this d over two times the square root of two R. So this is also going to go to infinity. So z naught, z naught is going to go to infinity. And that means that w naught here, if I solve for w naught, w naught is also going to go to infinity. So that means that for a planar cavity, the waste gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So the solution to uh, mirror, uh, so the solution to the Maxwell's equations inside of a a cavity made of two plane mirrors is just a plane, a plane wave, a standing wave between these two mirrors that's infinite in uh, in uh, in extent in both both directions. That's a planar cavity. Um, another limit is a spherical resonator. So if if we let d equal to r, that's a spherical spherical sometimes called a resonator. So if D equals 2R, what does that, what does that look like? Well, if this is my origin here and I have a radius R and I have a mirror that's of that radius and I have another radius R and a mirror of that radius and these are automatically separated by D so this is, these spherical mirrors are actually part of a, an actual, an actual sphere whose radius is at the origin. That's right on the edge of, of stability here. So uh, normally resonators aren't built like this, but what does that say about, about Z naught and W naught? So, so if I actually take D equals two R here, then I get two R over two R that's one minus one is zero. 
I get Z naught here goes to zero. Therefore W naught goes to zero. So in order to, to really have a spherical, a spherical resonator, the waste at the origin would have to get smaller and smaller and smaller and, and it would have to go to zero. So as I take these mirrors and I, and I move them out to, uh, to be uh, distance D, or actually, sorry, I should take, I say, as I move them in to be distance D, uh, then, uh, then this, this shrinks. Uh, no, no, I, sorry, D, D always has to be less than two R. So as I move them out, uh, the waste shrinks down to a point. And uh, this, this also makes some sense because this is like, we saw that in the, in the limit of very narrow, narrow beams, this looked more and more like just a spherical wave coming out from the origin. So if you look really far away, it just looks like a spherical wave coming out from the origin. So um, if you take your mirrors and you separate them out to be really part of a, an actual sphere, then the only solution is to have kind of a infinitely tiny point source. Um, and, and I would say here you have to be a little bit careful because some of the assumptions we made when we derived this broke down. So cavities aren't, aren't usually made to be actual pieces of spheres. Um, the, the case that, that is normally considered is where, where D equals R. And this is called a conformal, can you see that? Yeah, it's called a conformal cavity. Uh, can't even see the word cavity, conformal cavity. And let me just draw a picture of what that, what that looks like uh, up here. So that's, if that's my spherical cavity, my conformal cavity, um, if I were to start a, a radius of a sphere out here, um, draw this a little bit better. So this, this radius is also supposed to be the separation between the mirrors. So this distance between mirrors is also D. That means that I could have equally drawn a radius from here this way to make my other mirror. So the radius of the mirror is uh, as, as if a sphere is coming out of the center of the other mirror. That's a, that's a conformal cavity. Spherical, spherical cavity. And uh, if, if this is true, if R equals D, and we look at Z naught for a conformal cavity, uh, if R equals D, then we have two R or 2D over D, this is just two minus one. That's just square root of that is just one. And so Z naught is just D over two. So, so this distance here is Z naught. So the place where this beam turns from a sort of relatively horizontal into a, a linear cone, that smooth transition point Z naught that, that happens right at the surface of the mirror for a conformal cavity. Um, and, the, and the waste in this case, if I were to calculate W naught for a conformal cavity, uh, W naught for a conformal, this is lambda D over two pi and the square root of all that. So that's just a matter of solving for W naught with, with Z naught equaling half of D. Uh, and so this is sort of the geometric mean of the wavelength and the separation with this you know, little extra factor here, two pi. So you know, your order of magnitude, if you take the geometric mean, you multiply the wavelength times the size of the cavity, you take the square root, um, that gives you the scale for how, how big the, the waste is at the center. And uh, this has some 
well, let me let me draw. I, let me erase this picture here. I'll draw one more picture. So the reason why we tend to make cavities conformal is is uh, for two uh, two related reasons. One, it's sort of right in the middle of the stability criteria, so we don't have to. We're not near near some edge, or we're worried about things being stable. Uh, but more importantly, if if we were to draw rays, you had rays. So so imagine now these mirrors aren't one hundred percent reflective, but they're you know ninety nine point nine percent reflective. If you had a random ray coming in from the outside, and it entered the cavity, we were to do the ray tracing. So a ray entering would just kind of keep going. It would bounce off this mirror. If you were to do all of the angles of refraction, angles of reflection and everything, you would see that this would perfectly come horizontally. And then this would bounce perfectly like this. And this would bounce perfectly back. And then it would bounce back this way again. And so you would get the, the little bit of light that was able to leak in would go through this nice, nice pattern. And then you, know, you can imagine that at each of these reflections, a tiny little bit of light could leak out. This one would come back this way. So if you shine light in, even if it's not perfectly straight on, uh, you, you, would, uh, you would get some some resonance set up where the, the path that this would bounce around would be a closed path. And this would actually correspond to exciting some linear combination of not just the, the Gaussian cross-section mode, but all those other higher order modes that, that hopefully you plotted in your homework. So in order, so imagine that this wasn't perfectly, perfect, infinitely thin, but it had some, some size to it. If you were to plot what that looked like at the mirror, you could construct that out of some linear combination of all of those higher order modes. Those higher order modes form a complete basis. And just like in quantum, you can make, make any wave function you want out of the right superposition of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, for example, any complete basis. Um, the, those series of higher order donut modes plus speckled modes, if you, if you take that series out forever, any, any shape could be made of the right linear combination of, of those shapes. And what's nice about the conformal cavity is, uh, and the book goes into this in a little bit more detail, the, the phases associated with that weird arc tangent term all end up, uh, all end up combining with each other only for the case of this conformal cavity. So basically, if, if you have the mirror separated by their uh, radius of curvature, then you basically don't have to worry about that arc, arc tangent term. All of the all the different modes that you can excite all end up with the same the same phase or you know uh, integer multiples of two pi times times the phase. So uh, they don't they they resonate for exactly the same wavelengths. And that's not true if the cavity is not conformal. The, the modes at different, the, the different spatial modes, all those different patterns will resonate at slightly different frequencies. Whereas for a conformal cavity, all the, all the different spatial modes will, will resonate at the same series of frequencies. They're not gonna be slightly shifted with respect to each other. So that's why, uh, in, especially if you're making a, an analysis cavity where, where you're moving one of these mirrors and asking the question, how much light leaks through, how much, when you put in light, how much light gets out. If you're making an analysis cavity, you often make it a conformal cavity. And, uh, and this doesn't have to be exact. D doesn't have to be exactly R to within a wavelength. It just has to be pretty close in order for, uh, for all the, the different frequencies to line up like that. All right, so um, 
if you wanted, now would be a great time to watch the last in those series of three videos that I filmed with the, with the laser cavity and the conformal cavity. Uh, doing that maybe before you work on the homework would, would probably be a, a good idea. But uh, this will be the last I, I really have to say about cavities and, uh, and lasers for now. But uh, I, I don't think I'll really go back to the cavities or Gaussian beams. We're, we're finally done with this topic. And uh, on Wednesday, I will talk about polarization and what happens when, well, maybe on Wednesday, I'll stick to how do we characterize the polarization of a beam. Right now, I've just sort of treated things as some amplitude. I haven't worried too much about the vector nature of the electric field, but the electric field and magnetic field, they are vectors, so we have to worry about that. Um, and, uh, and then after that, we'll talk about what happens when different polarizations hit different uh, surfaces. And uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. All right, I will see you on, on Wednesday then.